I think the world of Andrew. He's a good brother, good brother. It's been one of my joys in being uh, an evangelist, an itinerant preacher as I get to travel around uh, all across the United States and around the world. Someone asked me last night how many countries. I think I've been in 25 different countries thus far, some of them uh, repeatedly. But um, it, it can be very discouraging as you look at the broad, visible spectrum of Christianity out there. There is so much compromise. There are so many moral failures. There is, there is all of that. There's so much false doctrine. Um, it, and it can be discouraging. But know this, that God has His people. Amen. God has His people all over the world. And He has His faithful shepherds all over the world. Many of them, most of them, are in smaller churches. There are some a few exceptions to that. John MacArthur would be a notable exception to that. But um, most, most of the good guys are in small churches that, that people have never heard of. Nobody's ever heard of them. But they labor away, uh, they labor away in anonymity. And, but they're faithful shepherds. And um, you know, they're, they're all across the United States. I go to these churches. They're, they're, they're in Uganda. They're in South Africa. They're in Ecuador. They're in Brazil. They're, they're, they are out there. So um, the visible spectrum of Christianity is a mess. But uh, God's church, His real church, is safe. It is safe. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, yes, there are threats, and I deal with those. And uh, Jordan Hall gave a, a robust uh, defense for the, for the need of discernment. I appreciated that so much. Um, but, um, but anyway, there are good guys out there, good, good churches. Okay, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and then we'll begin. Father, it can be discouraging, but uh, we, may we be encouraged today as, as uh, we spend some more time in your word. We thank you that you have preserved it for us. We thank you that uh, it is not only inerrant, it is not only infallible, it is sufficient for us, and uh, we thank you for that. We thank you that you have preserved it. We thank you for the faithful men out there who are teaching it, and um, uh, we pray, Lord, that as we deal with something this morning uh, in my presentation here, it's going to be a little, a little bit difficult, maybe, and um, uh, we we pray that you would encourage us uh, through your word by the power of your Holy Spirit and help us to obey what we learn. Lord, um, even though specifically uh, Christians are more led by the Holy Spirit than convicted by Him uh, in the New Testament, uh, we pray that, uh, that He will bring to us uh, needed correction uh, in this time. All for the glory of Christ, and it's in His name we pray. Amen. I invite you to take your copy of God's Word, open to the book of James, please. James chapter 3. Um, my first love, even though, uh, as Anthony said, I'm, I'm most known for my work in discernment and uh, specifically the Word of Faith movement, health and wealth, prosperity, gospel, I, uh, that is not at all my only interest. My first uh, commitment is to expository preaching. Uh, that is where my heart is. That is where the, the power is. And uh, I, But today we will be doing something more topical, though we will look at uh, several texts, but this will be a bit more topical. But uh, the title of this is Taming the Tongue and the Keyboard. <laughs> Taming the Tongue and the Keyboard. James chapter 3. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now if we put the bits into the horse's mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. 
The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessings and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be. May God bless the reading of His Word. As has already been said, and as I maintain, discernment is a vital discipline in the life of every believer. It is incumbent upon all of us to exercise discernment. 1 Thessalonians 5.21, we are to test all things. We are to test all things and hold fast to that which is good. Discernment is not an option for the believer. Your presence at this conference indicates that you have an interest in discernment. You have an interest in doctrine. You have an interest in theology. I commend you. These things are good. Those people who would claim to love Jesus but do not have an interest in doctrine and theology, I would submit to you they do not love Jesus nearly as much as they profess to love Him. Philippians chapter 1 verse 9, Paul says, In this I pray that your love would abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. The Bible never separates knowledge of God and love for God. The Bible always combines these things. So I commend you in your interest and um, um, love for doctrine and theology and discernment. These are good things. But I fear that many of us who do care about these things, sometimes we're very good at exercising discernment when it comes to doctrine and theology, but we're not so discerning when it comes to actually living it out, living out the Christian life, not so discerning in some of these things. Um, there is a danger, there is a need for discernment, and there is a danger in with it, danger with it, in that some people, not all, but some who have, uh, is, that is their singular focus of discernment, can, can become caustic, can become bombastic, can have an, an unnecessary edge to them. So there is that danger, and we need to be aware of that, and uh, we need to guard against it, because that is error as well. Uh, I'm going to kind of in generalities address the gorilla in the room. Uh, if unless you have just had your head in the sand for the last two months, you know what is going on within the um, within Christianity, the doctrinally sound wing of Christianity, which is the only wing. But you know what I mean by that. The the good guys. Uh, there has been this controversy that has erupted in the last couple of months. I'm going to be as general as possible because I know most of you in here know of what I'm speaking. Uh, this controversy erupted right at the time I was getting on an airplane to go to Singapore to preach for a couple of weeks and mercifully I was spared from this uh, just my the protection of being across an ocean and uh, and uh, having other tasks at hand uh, but I kept hoping and praying that this would die down and blow over but it never did and I had to come back from Singapore and I wish I was still in Singapore uh, it's been the, this has been the ugliest, most divisive thing I think I've ever seen. It has just been absolutely horrible. Absolutely horrible. Um, I have seen, as many of you have on social media, I just got on Twitter just a few months ago. I'm not a social media expert. I'm still absolutely mystified by hashtags. I don't know what they are. But... Uh, Many of you have uh, seen what's going on. I've seen name calling, coward, hypocrite, useful idiots, simpletons. That has been going on and it has not ceased. Um, 
I have seen disparaging comments regarding other people's appearances even. Now it's one thing if somebody intentionally disfigures themselves or intentionally dresses in such a way to make a statement. We're not talking about that. But, in, but comments that, that disparage people's appearances uh, over things that, over which they have no control. That is horrible. I have seen crass language. Language that without getting graphic language in reference to male anatomy. Using crass language in, in reference to this by people who claim to be Christians. Who claim to be some of our leaders in the faith. And this, this is coming from middle aged and upwards. I am amazed. I am amazed at how people in their middle age and, and even above years, somehow when they get behind a computer screen and have a keyboard in front of them, they revert to the maturity of, some, of a kid in junior high. It's just unbelievable to me in attacking people's motives. Be very careful about ascribing motives to someone. Now, sometimes you can you have you're pretty on pretty good ground. Sometimes people are flat out honest about their motives. But unless you really, really know a situation, really know a situation, be very careful about ascribing motives to someone. Be careful with that. Ephesians chapter five, verse four. The Apostle Paul writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. There must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting which is not fitting but rather giving of thanks. Colossians chapter 3, 8 through 10. Paul says, put away anger, wrath, malice, slander. There's been a lot of slandering going on from different sides and obscene talk from your mouth. Put it away. Don't engage in it. Put it away. Colossians 4, verse 6, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, so that you will know how to respond to each person. Let your speech be with grace. Ephesians 4, 29, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such as is good for edification, according to the need, so that it will give grace to those who hear. These verses aren't there just to take up the white spaces. They're there for a reason. And they're just as inspired as any other verse in Scripture. May your speech encourage, edify. Who has been encouraged by this controversy over the last two months? And by the way, if you haven't heard about it, consider yourself blessed. Who's been encouraged by this? Who's been edified by this? Yeah. Yeah, the only one who's been encouraged is Satan. There has been gossip tail-bearing. I'm going to, as best I can, stay away from names. But I have seen multiple tweets, a uh, few of which really, unfortunately, stick out in my mind. But uh, one well-known, quote-unquote, minister and, uh, said that he has it on good authority that half of the staff of a particular church does not like one of his staff members. He has it on good authority. Really, does he? Is that a fact? Well, I happen to have it on good authority that that's not true. And he has it on good authority. Think about the levels of sin in this. That is the definition of gossip and talebearing. That's the definition of it. And you're going to start off by sinning, by gossiping and talebearing. And then add on to that sin, use that sin to lead into the sin of intentionally trying to cause division within the elder body of another church. 
What are you doing? Proverbs 6, verse 16, There are six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven that are an abomination to Him. Haughty eyes, lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil. There is something wrong with someone who enjoys strife, who enjoys evil. False witness that utters lies, one who spreads strife among the brethren, one who spreads strife among the brethren. That is an abomination to God. That is an abomination to God. Just out of curiosity, I was tempted to do this, I'm not going to do it, but if I were to ask you to do the following, if I were to ask you to raise your hand if you think I have defended the interfaith dialogue between James White and Yasser Qadi, an imam. Raise your hand if you, th no, I mean don't, but if I, were to do, if I were to ask you to raise your hand if you think I've defended that, if you think I've defended James White, do you know what? I bet, I bet most of the hands in here would go up. But you know what? I haven't said a word about it. All of those people out there who think I've defended it, you know where they're getting that, from, that information from? From gossip. From slander. I have not said one syllable until this very moment about that interfaith dialogue that, by the way, happened back in January. And I can't tell you all the emails that I'm getting from people, oh, Justin, I cannot believe. I never thought you would compromise. I never thought you would compromise. I never thought you would... I had one lady email me. She said, I, I never thought that you and another prominent minister would, well, I'll just say, she said, I never thought you and John MacArthur would, would put Islam over Christianity. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? What a lie. You know where she's getting this information? From gossip, from slander. Bearing, intentionally trying to foment division among the brethren, and God hates it. Open with me to Romans chapter 1. As you're turning there, since I've kind of open this can of worms a little bit and <laughs> and I um, as I said I've not said one word about this and there's a reason I haven't said one word about it because merciful I, I wanted it to I want it to just blow over in the end and I saw how ugly it was I saw how divisive it was being I saw how it was just splitting people right down the middle and I didn't want to weigh into it I didn't want to contribute anything to it but there's been so much, so many lies, so many, so many, so many slanderous statements, so much gossip, that it's, it's. I fear that my hand has been forced, and even the Apostle Paul finally got to a point where he had to defend himself against lies and slander, and uh, and I'm not trying to do anyone any harm, um, but just so you know, so maybe at least you will know, and very soon I'll, I'll my, my ministry, my board. We'll put up a statement about this. I don't defend the interfaith dialogue. I wouldn't have done it. If I'd have lived in the area and known about it, I would not have attended it. I wouldn't have held it at a church. Now, I understand the church is not a building. I understand that. It's, it's the church is the called out ones. I, I understand that. I get that. But there is an optics issue there for people who don't understand those theological specifics and nuances, I wouldn't have held it in church. But you know what? Contrary to what um, some have said about me, that I criticize something I've never watched. Oh, I have watched it. I've watched both of those sessions twice, one of them three times. Like I say, don't, don't say that I'm defending it. I'm not defending it. I wouldn't have done it. But fair is fair. The gospel was presented 
the deity of Christ was defended, the, the Trinity was expounded upon, atonement, justification, redemption, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, the exclusivity of Christ. All of these things were there, and they were clearly there, and anyone who says they were not there either does not know what he or she is speaking of or is being intentionally dishonest. The gospel was there. And you know what? God does save some of his sheep out of Islam and out of Buddhism. And if there were people there, some of God's sheep wandering around aimlessly in that Islamic wasteland, there was more than enough there for one of God's sheep to perk his ears up and hear the voice of the shepherd and go to him. Did that happen? I have no idea. But anybody who would say the gospel was not there, either doesn't know what he or she is saying, it's being intentionally dishonest. But all of this, all of this is stemming from gossip and tail-bearing and slander. Now, Romans 1, 8, I mean, excuse me, 28. Romans 1, 28 through 32. This is a sobering passage of Scripture. The Apostle Paul writing says, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind. Don't miss that. God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Being fi and watch this list of sins. Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, <laughs> evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers. Haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, lacking discernment, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. That is a sobering passage of Scripture. Dear friends, Paul here is not talking about immature Christians. He's not talking about backslidden Christians. Backslidden is not even a New Testament concept. He's talking about lost people. These are people who have been given over to a depraved mind. He's talking about the condemned. And right in the same list of sins, horrific sins, the sexually immoral, the wicked, the people who invent evil things, who hate God, right in that same list of sins, gossip, slander. Do you see how serious this is? And may I, may I submit to you that if your life is marked, characterized by one or more of these sins, then you really need to do some inventory you really need to examine yourself to see if you are in the faith? Gossip is a serious sin. It's in the same list of all these other sins. Now, we're not talking about an occasional, check, check, an occasional stumble into sin. All of us do. A Christian can and does stumble into sin, but a Christian does not swim in sin. A Christian does not enjoy sin. A Christian does not relish sin. He does not enjoy it. He does not look for opportunities to sin. When a Christian sins, it grieves him. And when a Christian is confronted in his sin, he repents. It may not be instantaneous. It may not be on the spot. It may not be overnight. But eventually, a Christian will bend the knee and he will repent. And so if your life is characterized, marked, you have an habitual display of one or more of these sins, you need to examine yourself to see if you're in the faith because that's not how a Christian acts. Dear friends, the Holy Spirit of God not only illumines the meaning of God's Word to us, He also gives us the ability to obey it. He gives us the ability to obey it, to appropriate those truths. 
The Holy Spirit is not a weakling. He's not a theological girly man. He is strong. 1 Corinthians 6, Do not be deceived. For neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, slanderers will inherit the kingdom of God. And Paul says, for such were some of you. You were those things. You're not now. You were. And then he says, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. Notice those three terms. Washed, sanctified, justified. Those two bookends are terms of salvation. Terms of regeneration. The new birth. You were washed. You are justified. And what's right in the middle? You are sanctified. Those whom God saves, He sanctifies. There are no exceptions. It is a package deal. He not only illumines the meaning of God's Word, He gives us the, the power to obey it and to appropriate it. And if one's life is marked by habitual unrepentant sin, that is a sign of someone being in need of union with Christ. There is a time and a place for confrontation. There is. There is a time and a place for confrontation. Let's go to Romans chapter 12. Romans 12. Paul says, verse 17, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Paul says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Sometimes it's not possible to be at peace with all men. Sometimes we have to stand and we have to fight. If possible, though, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. We are to be at peace with unbelievers. Our conduct is to be godly conduct, in part to be a witness for the gospel of Christ amongst unbelievers. It is important that we have a godly witness to the watching world. Be at peace with unbelievers. And you know what, dear friends? That includes being at peace with Muslims. Now, I am under no illusions. I'm not living in candy land. I don't think everything is sunshine and lollipops and unicorns. <laughs> Islam has a problem. All false religions, anything aside from biblical Christianity is a false religion. All of its adherents will go to the same hell. But not all false religions are as violent as Islam is. Okay? It wasn't Hare Krishnas that flew airplanes into the World Trade Towers. I get that. Islam has an issue. There's a problem there. It, is, it, is, it has an inherent violence within it. I understand that. I get that. But as has already been said this morning, the greatest threat to the church... Islam poses no threat to the church. Okay? John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Is a strange, they simply will not follow. They'll flee. I think I'm, are we losing the batteries? This keeps going in and out. Or, do you think the batteries need replacing? Keep Just keep going? Or? Yeah, we can hear you mostly. Okay, all right. Okay. Islam does not pose a threat to the church. My sheep hear me. My, they, my sheep hear my voice. I know my sheep. My sheep know me. I know my sheep. They will not follow another. They will, they, they will not follow the voice of a stranger. Read John chapter 10. All throughout John chapter 10. 
There, was, there is not going to be, the, this possibility, this scenario will never happen. There will never be a Christian sitting in any venue, I don't care what it is, in any venue, listening to someone expound upon Islam and say, huh, wow, that is really compelling. I think I'm going to follow Muhammad. That's not going to happen. That's a theological impossibility. Could they pose a threat physically? Sure. Not spiritually. Not spiritually. It's not going to happen. Our conduct is to be good even amongst Muslims. I have had a number of opportunities to witness to Muslims. Airports, traveling around, around the world. One notable, just a couple of months ago, I was in Greece. A few months ago now, I was in Greece. And long story short, we were in Ephesus which is in Turkey. 98% Islamic country. 98%. And we were in Ephesus to go see some of the ruins and we were going down this, this really jagged, long pathway that I couldn't begin to walk down. My scooter, little rinky-dink scooter, wouldn't begin to go through it. So uh, there was a little business area set up, a little commercial area and uh, lots of businesses sprinkled around there for the tourists. And uh, they keep a wheelchair there for the specific purpose for someone like me or an elderly person that can't walk. And so they have this wheelchair there and um, this young man named Fati, F-A-T-I, 21 years old, he, uh, he brought up a wheelchair to me for me to sit in. And the, uh, one of the pastors on our group was going to push me down through the ruins there of Ephesus. And I sat down in the wheelchair, and the wheelchair, he pushed me, and it literally went about a foot, foot and a half at the most, and it just stopped. Oh, yeah, that's weird. So he, so he backed it up, tried it again, same thing, just stopped. Would not push. And so we got to looking, and on the front, right front wheel, one of the spokes was broken. I mean, it was, the wheel was just busted. Now, I've been in a lot of wheelchairs. I've never seen that before. I've never seen that before. But the, the spoke was busted. And uh, so Fati was there, and he said, wow, this, he said, this is really strange. This is a wheelchair. It, we just used it yesterday, and it was fine. But now it's busted. They keep it in the office there for this exact purpose. And he said, well, well, let me call someone. So long story short, he got on the phone and he actually called an ambulance and asked them if they had a wheelchair for me. They did, but it was going to take a good half an hour before it would arrive. He said, well, that's okay, just bring it. So, so we had half an hour to kill while we're waiting for the ambulance to come for a wheelchair for me. And uh, so... I walked over and sat down, Fati and I sat down, my wife Kathy was with me, we sat down at a table in this little business, and there was about six or seven other Muslim men sitting at tables around me, and most of them smoking cigarettes, it was hard to sit there, but I uh, sat down with Fati, and for the next half hour, I shared the gospel with him, and you know what, he listened to every word of it. And he was interested. You know, you can tell when somebody's listening to you, they're not really digging what you're saying. He was interested in it. He wanted to hear. And all of those men around me, they were pretending like they weren't listening, but you could tell by their body language they were. They were all listening to me as well. And I went fully into the gospel. Full explanation of it. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe, maybe there's a sheep somewhere in that group that one day will go to the shepherd. Who knows? But you know what? If we make, if we make Muslims our enemy, we're not going to have these opportunities. Muslims are not our enemy. They're the mission field. May your speech be seasoned with grace. Speak the truth in love. Our conduct should be godly around unbelievers, Muslims, and other false religions. It should also be godly around our brothers. We should have God godly conduct with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, there's a news flash. <laughs> you wouldn't think that would be so hard, would you? But it is, apparently. You know what? I can have differences of opinion with my brothers and sisters on minor theological points. You know, we can still have fellowship in Christ. And I would say as a great example, look at John MacArthur and R.C. Sproul. You know, here, here are these two faithful men of God. They're on different pages when it comes to eschatology. But you know what? They love each other. 
you can tell by how they interact. They love one another. You know, there are some hills worth dying on, and there are some that aren't. And they treat one another with respect. Be at peace. Be at peace. Have godly conduct around your brothers. There is a time and place for confrontation. Now, this is a bit simplistic, but, but just to kind of get this in your mind a little bit. There are three categories of quote-unquote Christians. Okay, now I say quote-unquote, and I don't mean to make scary quotes, but, but you know, <laughs> three categories. Professing believers. Okay, let me say that. Three categories, at least, of professing believers. There are your wolves. There are your charlatans. Out-and-out out heretics, false teachers. Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, Joel Osteen, Bill Johnson. Uh, the, the, these guys, uh, Todd Bentley, claim to be Christians, but they're not. Okay, they're not. You can tell by what they teach. You can tell by the conduct of their lives. You can tell by their complete lack of discernment and con years and years and decades even long of teaching heresies. That's not a Christian. People who exploit the poor and the sick and the elderly for financial gain, those aren't Christians. Those are wolves. You don't have to treat them with kid gloves. They must be opposed, vehemently, stridently opposed. They're wolves. But then you've got another group, and they're what I call kind of the confusing brothers. They're, they're some people who, some men who have the right gospel, uh, at least seem to, maybe not go into some of the depth I would like, but they're not teaching heresy. You know, they're, they're, not, they're, not, they're not false teachers. But you see them, and then you see them do some, something every once in a while, really kind of leaves you scratching your head, like, why is this guy associating with these folks. What's going on there? Why is this guy on TBN raising money for TBN? He doesn't believe in that prosperity theology. What's he doing on the stage with Paul Crouch? Raising money for TBN. It's a head scratcher. You know, they're confusing. And so these kind of people, you don't denounce them as heretics necessarily. I mean, you, you shouldn't do that. Uh, but neither do you have to give your full-throated endorsement to them either. You know, I, I'm not going to point somebody to, to an individual like that or who, who sits down with T.D. Jakes and treats T.D. Jakes, who's a modalist, like a brother in Christ. I'm not going to endorse somebody like that. They're confusing brothers. But then you have some real brothers. You, then you have some men who, who do have sound doctrine, and maybe they do something with which you would not agree, or they do something that's not the way you would do it. Give them some, don't automatically jump to the worst possible conclusion about them. If they have a long track record of faithfully preaching the gospel, faithfully, faithfully defending the gospel, standing up for the exclusivity of Christ, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, especially if they, if they hold to the doctrines of grace, God's sovereignty and salvation, they have ably defended Islam and Roman, uh, or debated Islam and Roman Catholicism and any other, number of these other cults, and they do something that kind of leaves you scratching your head, don't automatically brand them as an enemy. Give them a little space. And, and ask yourself, all right, well, is this, is this really something I ought to be overly concerned about? Is this, is this really a threat? Ask yourself that question. Is, is it really that serious? Remember this, dear friends. I'm quoting my wife here. She says, the best of men are men at best. The best of men are men at best. And you know what? Every once in a while, even the, the, the solid, the top of the top guys whom we would all love and respect, every once in a while, once in a blue moon, you might hear them say something that kind of <coughs> makes you do like a, a dog cocking his head. You know, like, huh? <laughs> Don't jump all over their case if that happens. They've got a long track record. They've earned the benefit of the doubt, don't you think? Is it really that serious? Is this issue really that serious? And if it is, here's what I would commend to you. If you think the issue is really that serious, pick up this new invention that's just come out. It's called a telephone. And you call that person and you say, hey, I heard you say such and such or I saw you do such and such. Can you help me understand that? Send them an email. Write them a letter. Don't automatically start blasting them. Call them enemies. 
go to him in private. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1, brethren, Galatians 6 verse 1, brethren, if anyone is caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of what? Gentleness. Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Oh, well, he's got, a, he's got a public ministry, so he's open to public critique. Well, yeah, I've got a public ministry, and my ministry is open to public critique, too. But I hope if I were to say something that somebody finds a little odd or just doesn't sound like something I would normally say, that they would give me the benefit of the doubt and call me before they start blasting me all over the evil world of social media. Boy, I tell you, Spiritual maturity can be measured in great part by how one handles persecution, by how one handles temptation, and by how one handles social media. <laughs> it's a pretty good marker of just how mature a person really is. And if you don't get a reply from this person, before you blast them again, ask, them, ask the question again, is it really that serious? Is it really worth it? Do they have a solid track record? Yeah, the good guys do. Here's another question. Are they members in good standing of a good, solid local church? And you know what? All the good guys are. Not only are they members, many of them are actually elders in their churches. So if someone does something that you find a bit odd or you, you might even disagree with, know that that person, the good guys, are, in member, are members of good standing in their churches and they have an elder body around them. They may be elders themselves, but they have an elder body around them to provide them with a level of accountability that you and I can't do. There's, that, that's... Any, I was, we were talking this, this morning, parachurch ministries, if the church was doing exactly what it should, if the church was hitting on all cylinders, there would be no need for a parachurch ministry. And I say that as a head of a parachurch ministry. If the real church was doing what it should, then there wouldn't be so many people deceived by word of faith and all this other stuff. Parachurch ministries do have a place. They, they serve a function, but they, if they are not tied, I mean closely tied to a local church, they should be treated as spiritual pariahs because that's what they are. If they are not tied, closely tied to a local church and under that church's authority, then they are doing more harm than good. Don't bring an accusation against an elder lightly. 1 Timothy 5.19 Do not entertain an accusation against an elder except on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Are elders perfect? Are they, uh, can they never make a mistake? No, that's not the case at all. But the position which they hold do, does carry with it some, some respect. It does carry with it some authority in a sense. And we are to give these men the benefit of the doubt. Don't bring an accusation against an elder unless it's serious, unless you have people backing you up. It's a serious thing. Don't do it lightly. And remember, if you're not a member of their church, they have elders. They should be members. They are, it's not that they are above criticism. It's not that there cannot be legitimate accusations, but be careful. Ask yourself, is this really worth it? Is it really worth it? Matthew chapter 18, Jesus says, verse 6, Matthew 18, verse 6, Jesus says, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. It's a very serious thing to put up a stumbling block for other believers. A very serious thing. Jesus says it would be better for you to have a millstone, a big heavy stone that donkeys pulled around, hung around your neck and thrown into the sea than to cause one of these little ones, these people who are weaker in the faith, younger in the faith, immature in the faith maybe more so than you, to cause one of them to stumble. And I can tell you, 
this, this interfaith dialogue thing happened back in January. And you know what? No one was really stumbling over it now. Everybody's stumbling over it. There's tons of people stumbling over it. I've seen good, doctrinally sound people split down the middle, divided over this, and they're at one another's throats. And again, I'm not defending the interfaith dialogue. Don't hear me wrong. I'm not defending all that. Defending that. I have a problem with the way it's been handled. On all sides. On all sides. Or both sides, I suppose. Don't be a stumbling block. And our conduct can be a stumbling block. I can't tell you how many people I have talked to and how many people, some of my, my wife's girlfriends have said they have, they have just been stumbling all over this because they look and they see these people who are supposed to be our leaders in the faith, they're supposed to be models of Christian behavior, going after one another. With, and they're stumbling over it. It's a very serious thing. It's a very serious thing. Jesus in John chapter 13, verse 35, He says, By this all men will know you are my disciples. How? That you have love one for another. Do we forget that that's there? How many people do you think, how, how many of the watching world do you think would look at, at us and say, Oh, wow, I can tell they belong to Christ. Look at how they love one another. Hardly. The secular media has picked this up and they have run with it. A watching world out there. And people are stumbling all over the place. They are stumbling all over the place. I want to say something as we get ready to close about repentance. And I've heard this too. Various parties have been called to repent on this. To repent on this. Well, I'm not going to repent. I'm not going to repent. Have you, have you called him to repent? Have you said the same thing to him? He hasn't repented. Why should I? That's a person who doesn't understand repentance. Repentance footnoted with excuses is not repentance. It doesn't matter what the guy, other guy does or does not do. If you realize you're in sin, especially when other people point it out to you, have the grace and the maturity to bend the knee and say, you know, you're right. I was wrong. I'm sorry. I'm going to make it right. I confess it. Sorry, I shouldn't have done it. Repent. Doesn't matter what the other guy does or does not do. Zacchaeus, remember Zacchaeus? Wee little man, wee little man was he? Says he was the, the chief tax collector, right? He was the chief tax collector, which means there were what? There were other tax collectors. Did Zacchaeus say when he, when he had that encounter with Christ, well, Jesus, the other tax collectors aren't repenting? No. He just repented. He did the right thing, irrespective of what others do or do not do. And someone who refuses to do that is someone who is lacking spiritual maturity. And dear friends, we are not in competition with one another. Andrew and I were talking about this earlier. I'm not in competition with striving for eternity. I'm not in competition with the Bible-thumping wing nuts. I'm not in competition with Alpha and Omega. I'm not in competition with anybody. We shouldn't be. We should not be in competition with one another. We have an enemy, and it's not each other. We shouldn't be about building our own kingdoms. We should be about working for the kingdom and for the king who reigns over that kingdom. And God doesn't need any of us. I think a lot of, a lot of these people, they get egos and they think, well, God needs you. God needs me. You know what? God doesn't need me. I could drop dead before I finish this sermon. And God could raise somebody else up to do exactly what I'm doing, probably do a much better job of it. God doesn't need me. He doesn't need you. We are bugs on God's windshield. He doesn't need any of us. We should consider it joy and a, an incredible blessing and privilege just to be used of the Lord. We should not be in competition. 
Turn with me to Jude, and we'll begin to land this plane. Jude, verses 3 through 4. Jude, verses 3 through 4. Jude says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Don't miss how he opens that section. He says, Beloved, I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation. In other words, Jude was saying to his readers, Men, brothers, sisters, I would love nothing more than to write to you about our common salvation. I would love nothing more than to just write to you about the gospel, to talk about the glories of our King, the richness of His mercy, what a privilege it is to be adopted into the family of God through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, how merciful God has been to us. I would love nothing more than to talk about that. But I felt it necessary to write to you, to warn you. There's false teachers. Peter warned about them. Jude says they're here. Certain men who have crept in unawares. Jude knew that there was a time and a place for warning about false teachers. There is. 25 of the 27 books in the New Testament directly warn about false teachers. It is a mandate from Scripture. False teachers have been a problem in the church practically since day one. They remain a problem today. It is incumbent upon us to mark them, Romans 16, and avoid them and warn people of them. This we must do. But it is a task that should grieve us. It should grieve us that it is even necessary. And I think I can say with a crystal clear conscience before God that I enjoy doing what I do in my seminar, Clouds of That Water, going around the world, teaching people, equipping people, because by God's grace, He allows me to see just a little bit of the fruit of that. And I'm encouraged by that, that people are being helped, they're being equipped. That encourages me. It does. It keeps me going. But you know what? At the same time, I wish this was not necessary. I would love nothing more than to wake up in the morning and see splattered all over Drudge Report, Benny Hinn repents. I would love nothing more than to have all of these false teachers either come to an overdue end or repent and bend their knee to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I wish it wasn't necessary. We should much rather spend our time talking about the glories of the gospel. It should grieve us that this is necessary. And there is something wrong if someone seems to enjoy strife, to enjoy division, to enjoy um, engaging in these issues and battles. Is it necessary? Yeah. But I wish it wasn't. And there are some people who seem like they would almost be disappointed if this was not the case. It would be disappointed. They would be, their life would have no meaning. And if that is someone's attitude, there's something wrong. Jude knew he had to do it, but he didn't want to. Paul says in Ephesians 4.15, Speak the truth in love. We are to speak the truth, but we are to speak it in love. Speaking the truth in love does not mean being soft. It does not being, mean being wishy-washy. But it does mean that we are to be compassionate. It does mean that we are to take this task seriously. We are to speak the truth in love. And dear friends, the in love part is just as inspired and just as authoritative as the speak the truth part. And if you can't speak the truth in love then do God a favor and don't speak it. Don't speak it. Talk about the weather. Talk about politics. Talk about college football. Don't talk about the truth. If you can't speak it in love, it is just as authoritative as the truth. If you can't speak the truth in love, don't speak it until you can figure out how to do it.
Let's stop shooting at each other and stop giving other people, weaker brothers and sisters, cause for offense and stumbling. Let's close. Father, we pray that as your children, those who have been graciously adopted by you into your family, that, that as your Holy Spirit illumines the meaning of your word, he not only does that, but he also, uh, that we also avail ourselves to the power that he gives us to appropriate it. And if we can't live out what we teach, we, we shouldn't teach it. We, we shouldn't speak the truth if we can't speak the truth in love. So, Lord, help us to do that. And, uh, Lord, bring correction uh, for those of us, myself included, if we err in that. And, uh, Lord, we do pray for unity among the brethren. Per John 17. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Quick announcement.